All right, good evening folks, it's Enforcer Matt, and welcome back to another Short War video, and today we have very big news coming out of the Russian city of Omsk. We're currently learning that a major Russian military manufacturing plant in the Russian city of Omsk is burning to the ground as we speak, and we're waiting to see how bad the damage is really going to be, because if that facility is taken out, that would be a very big win for the Ukrainians in their war effort. We're also hearing as well that Ukraine says that a Ukrainian grain ship leaving the ports of Ukraine, heading down to the Middle East, was attacked by a Russian missile and it looks like Russia is back to their old ways by attacking these grain ships and of course those are civilian targets and not military targets and it looks like they're being attacked once again and also we're getting word as well that NATO countries are starting to urge the United States to allow permission to shoot down Russian drones when they enter NATO airspace and we're hearing that specifically from Lithuania but with that we're jumping into our first article of the day which goes to war translated and this is by far the biggest story of the day we're seeing in the Russian city of Omsk a very big fire the Omsk Transmash Plant, and that plant is involved, like I said, in the production of the TOS-1 thermobaric launcher and also tank maintenance. Specifically, the T-80 tank that Russia has, they work on modernizing those tanks at this facility and it is now on fire. So let's take a look at the video and see how large the fire is. So right here, you can see the Russian city of Omsk, and out there in the distance is a very large plume of smoke coming from the manufacturing plant, and we can only assume the fire's been raging probably for at least a few hours, and also it looks like the fire might be spreading to other parts of the plant. So we'll have to see if there's other footage coming out of maybe the Russian fire department showing up to do their clown show to try to put this out, but right now we're really not sure. But with that, we're moving on to our next post here, and this one is a Wikipedia article which shows us what a TOS-1 weapon looks like. And I'm sure a lot of you in the audience have seen this weapon before. This is the thermobaric launcher called the TOS-1, and we have seen these in Ukraine a few times before, and they're actually used to launch the thermobaric weapons, which basically cause overpressure and also cause a large shock wave, and it's a very devastating weapon, and Russia is known to use that. So these are being manufactured at this plant, and that was just to give you some context as to what this weapon was in case you were unfamiliar with it. But with that, we're jumping into our next article, and this one goes to Nexta. And in this post right here, we get more footage of the fire itself happening happening at this plant. So let's take a look at this photo first. You can actually see a photo from the train yard near the city of Omsk. There's that massive fire out in the distance. This is a pretty clear image of how large it really is. And there's a train for scale reference. That fire is very large, but we also have a drive-by video of the plant itself. So let's take a look at this one. And right there you can see there is the plant itself right over here and it is on a very large fire. It is raging and who knows what started the fire. It could have been maybe a partisan. It could have been a Ukrainian saboteur. We really don't know or it could have been simply Russian incompetence. Someone was smoking in the wrong spot once again. That's of course always a possibility but we can see here that a fire has indeed started and it's very large. So once again a very big win for the Ukrainians if this facility is totally taken out and I'm very glad to see it. But with that we're moving into our next article here and this one's going to go to Ukraine world. And unfortunately, we're getting some very bad news that Russia has once again returned to attacking civilian grain vessels leaving Ukraine. And right here, we actually have a statement from Zelensky himself. Uh, the post says, the Russian army fired a missile at a cargo ship carrying wheat for Egypt immediately after it left Ukrainian territorial waters, said President Zelensky. But fortunately, even though this was not a good thing, uh, thankfully, nobody was killed in the attack. So the ship was severely damaged right here. And as you can see in the photo, this is a lot of damage from that missile. And over here, you can actually see more debris from that right here. It's really torn that ship up quite a bit. And also over here, you see that there appears to be some bending in the metal from where that missile hit. So this is not good whatsoever. And this is not the first time that Russia has attacked civilian grain vessels, but it probably sadly will not be the last time either because Russia really doesn't care about upholding the law. They just hope to basically hit whatever they can. And now they're starting to hit civilians once again intentionally to try to stop these grain shipments. So not good to see, but it is kind of what it is at this point. But with that, we're moving into our next article, and this one goes to the North American Aerospace Defense Command, also known as NORAD. And we are learning that sometime late yesterday, NORAD detected, tracked, and intercepted two Russian military aircraft operating in the Alaska Air Defense Identification Zone, also known as an ADIZ. Uh, and also, NORAD fighter jets from the U.S. conducted the intercept near Alaska, and the Russian aircraft remained in international airspace, and they did not enter American or Canadian sovereign airspace. And this Russian activity in the Alaska ADIZ 
CIZ is not seen as a threat according to NORAD, and NORAD will continue to monitor competitor activity near North America and meet presence with presence. So it's very good to hear NORAD did always intercept these uh, planes going near the Alaska ADIZ. This is not too unusual. This does happen on a occurring basis, but we have seen another incident here, which NORAD has taken care of, and we intercepted the Russian aircraft with fighter jets. We're really not told what the aircraft were. I guess that's sort of unimportant at this point. It was probably Russian bombers or something like that, maybe a fighter jet, but they were turned away by our U.S. fighter jets. So very good to hear. And with that, we're jumping into our next article, which goes to Nexta. And in this article, we're starting to hear some frustration from NATO members about not being allowed to shoot down Russian drones that enter NATO airspace. Right here, we hear from Lithuania. They are now urging NATO to shoot down Russian drones entering any alliance territory. And the Lithuanian defense minister has called for changes to NATO's air patrol mission in the Baltic states following the recent downing of a Russian military drone in Latvia. And specifically, the uh, defense minister said the air patrol should not only monitor, but should also, when necessary, speed up NATO's decision-making process so the planes can take off immediately and destroy the drones. So his statement here is actually very telling me, is of course the public is not made privy to exactly what the exact process is to make a decision to shoot down these Russian missiles, because it appears to be based on his statement that they actually have to make a decision as NATO as a whole to shoot down these drones that come into their territory. So to me, honestly, I may be interpreting this incorrectly, but it sounds like if a drone enters, like for example, Polish airspace, which is a NATO country, then they have to seek permission from the NATO alliance itself before they can shoot that down. That's what this statement right here seems to suggest. But let me know down in the comments below if you think I'm misinterpreting that, but that seems to be the way it is. And that might explain why nobody's shooting stuff down because they can't get a consensus among the NATO members to actually take the thing out of the sky. So that could be very telling as to why we have not shot down the drones up to this point. And maybe that might be something to improve uh, because like the Lithuanian defense minister said, we need to be able to actually take these things out of the sky and not only look at them and stare at them and hope that nothing happens, we need to eliminate that threat. And right now we're not doing that. So I must say good on the Lithuanian defense minister for speaking up about that because that really is an issue that needs to be fixed. But with that, we're jumping into our next post here and this one also goes to Nexta and we're learning from Zelensky that he's now confirming the Russian counteroffensive in the Kursk region, which is mainland Russia. And according to Zelensky, it goes according to our, meaning our Ukrainian plan. He also added that Ukraine has long seen the accumulation of troops in Belarus, and he said we control this process. So I think we'll have to take Zelensky at his word on this one, because we're really not sure exactly what the precise plan is, even in the Kursk region of Russia right now. We have an idea that maybe it's a land-for-land -land exchange, or maybe simply Ukraine is trying to build up a, maybe a buffer zone, like Zelensky had said in the past. That's also a possibility. But whatever's happening, he says it's still going according to plan. And we do know that Russia has mounted a counteroffensive in the region, and we're not sure exactly how large that offensive will be, but now Zelensky has officially confirmed it. So now we know Ukraine will be battling the Russian forces directly in the Kursk region, and the fighting is bound to ramp up, uh, and right now in the very near future. But with that, we're jumping into our next post here, which goes to the Ukraine's Pravda in English. And remember that just a few days ago, we were told by the United States that Iran has delivered ballistic missiles to Russia in the quantity of about a few hundred or so, and we're actually getting satellite images emerging of the ship that delivered the Iranian missiles to Russia itself. So now we have photo evidence proving the exact ship that brought the missiles to Russia through the Caspian Sea. So let's take a closer look at these images and see what we can spot. So right here in the first image, you can actually see this is the cargo ship that's allegedly been transporting missiles from Iran to Russia. And this is allegedly a Russian flagged cargo ship, uh, which apparently was dispatched to Iran to pick the missiles up and then drove all the way back to Russia to deliver them to the ports through the Caspian Sea. And right here, you see a larger image showing it docked at the port. This is an active port, by the way, and there's that ship right in the middle. And also down here, you can see the suspected path of the actual ship. It went from Russia up here at the port all the way through the Caspian Sea down to the port here in near Tehran in Iran. And it picked the missiles up and then headed right back with them. So there is more proof coming from sources from apparently Sky News showing this ship right here taking missiles back to uh, Russia. So not good to see. And of course, this is more evidence of that. And Russia is suspected of putting these missiles into action in the next couple of weeks. So hopefully the West will actually sanction Iran further and maybe take even more actions to stop this from happening in the future. And with that, we're moving into our next article here. And this one's going to go to Insider Paper. And we're hearing another threat from Putin. Yet another one. He makes these all the time, but he has yet another one for us. And this post says, Putin says that long-range arms for Ukraine would mean that NATO countries are at war with Russia. And at this point, I really can't keep straight because Putin said before that Russia's already at war with NATO. He said that before. And now he's saying that NATO countries are at war with Russia if they send long-range arms. So Putin keeps 
flip-flopping all over the place, changing the definition of NATO being at war with Russia, and also all over the place. Like, you really can't keep it straight, because it's all lies, and he knows it. Uh, and at this point, the long-range arms have been approved by Britain, for example, the Storm Shadow, to be used inside of mainland Russia. So, it's already been approved. So, where is Putin's declaration of war on the West? Uh, who knows? Uh, because right now, he's just uh, spewing off of the mouth once again, and I don't really see any substance behind it. So, I would take this as another empty threat from Putin, as always. But anyways, moving on to our last post of the day. This one goes to Inside Geopolitics. And real quick, jumping away from the Ukraine topic for just a moment, we have some news out of North Korea. Apparently, North Korea fired multiple short-range ballistic missiles into the East Sea from Pyongyang on Thursday morning, and that's the first since July. So, apparently, a little rocket man is back to firing missiles off uh, once again to intimidate his neighbors, and it, this is pretty usual for North Korea. It hasn't happened since July, but of course, North Korea always tests stuff like this, and it appears they're right back to it. But with that, that is actually our last news article of the day. So I hope you found today's video informative, and if you have, please press the like button on this video, and also subscribe to the Enforcer channel as well, because we try to post short war updates like this every single day that there's news available, and we greatly appreciate to see that the audience enjoys these updates. Also, if you want to support the channel financially, you can do so on our Patreon page, and the link is in the description below for Patreon, where you can go over there and sign up for a monthly membership, and help support the channel that way, which is a huge help, 